Next, we're going to hear from a fellow who was also in Honolulu that day, but he has kind of a different version of the story to tell. Chuck Kohler is one of maybe 1,200 to 1,500 surviving Pearl Harbor survivors. That's what we have left now. He was a member of the Aerial Patrol Squadron 23, which was on Ford Island, based there at the center of Pearl Harbor. He sustained injuries, was there when the first bombs were dropped. But before we get to Chuck's story, there's an introduction he would like to make. Thank you. I, I'm having trouble understanding what you're saying. I've lost all my hearing. Well, Chuck, you, you have a special guest with you here today, a family member that, who you'd like to introduce. Uh, I'm definitely proud of her. Uh, we have a granddaughter with us here today, uh, Kara Kohler from Clayton. She's an Olympic champion. Kara, would you please stand to be recognized? <laughs> We, we wanted to bring her here today because I'm sure the students that are here today will be much more interested in what she would have to share with them than the stories that us old veterans might have to share with them. So uh, you students, when this is over, that's the one you want to talk to right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stan. All right, so Chuck, let's, let <laughs> you've embarrassed your granddaughter, but I can tell this is not new. Is this <laughs> they've played this game before. So let's... Let's go back to that morning. Tell us what life at Ford Island was like uh, for a fellow of your, of your pay grade, of your rank, what you were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and then walk us through that morning. Well, I was in the duty section assigned the 0800 to 1200 security watch at our Aerial Patrol Squadron BP-23's hangar, which is located on the harbor inlet end of Naval Air Station, Ford Island, right in the center, the bullseye of Pearl Harbor. Uh, I had arrived at the hangar early, and I was in an upper-level office attempting to type a letter to my dear sweet mother. Uh, I heard the sound of an approaching aircraft in the background, but that's not unusual. Where are naval air station airplanes come and go, but not usually on a Sunday and certainly not that early in the morning. Uh, the sound of that airplane grew louder and louder, and I'm thinking, well, okay, a couple of the aircraft carriers similar to this had left the harbor the previous week to deliver short-range aircraft, to our military forces on Midway and Wake Island, and I figured they must be returning, and as usual, they will launch their aircraft while they're still out at sea. Those airplanes come in and operate off the land base while the carrier is in the harbor. Suddenly, the sound of that airplane changed, and I knew immediately that it was in a power dive. And I'm thinking, oh, that's one of those carrier group pilots. No, he's got a little bit bored with that regulation formation flying. He's wanting to do a little hot dog and have a little fun. I'm thinking, boy, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes when the commanding officer gets a hold of him. He's really going to be in trouble. Little did I realize that it was those of us there on the ground and on the ships that were going to be in trouble very, very shortly. Suddenly and almost simultaneously, there was a tremendous roar and bomb fragments, explosion debris, and window glass came crashing into the back of my head, ears, neck, and onto my shoulder. Uh, all those of you who have been involved in similar events, and I'm sure there are many of you here that have, will maybe remember that something like that can kind of derail your train of thought. You know, it did mine anyway. It took me a few moments to get my train of thoughts back together, but even when I did, I'm still thinking it's one of our friendly air group pilots hot dogging, crashed. I'm gonna go down and see if I could be of some help. I got, got pushed myself back from that debris-covered desk type, rather got up, shook off as much of that debris as I could, and started for the door. Uh, it was then that I thought, oh boy, I might be in trouble up here using this typewriter. You know, I'm on watch and I'm not authorized to use a typewriter. So I reached back, grabbed that unfinished letter, ripped it out of the carriage of that typewriter, crumbled it in my hand, and threw it in a wastebasket as I went out the door. You know, when I got on the lower level, went out through the narrow opening, left the unclosed end of the big rolling steel hangar door, the sound of another aircraft. I looked up and here comes this airplane in a steep power dive and I'm seeing what's looking like blinking or flashing lights on the front, hearing strange popping and buzzing sounds all around me, but I'm, I'm just a 17-year-old ex-farm boy, never been to war before. I don't recognize them for what they are, you know. Later, I was told that what I thought was blinking and flashing lights was actually machine gun muzzle flashes, and those popping, buzzing, and whizzing sounds that I was hearing were those machine gun bolts striking and ricocheting off that steel hangar door right behind me and off the concrete apron on which I was standing. By the way, if you go to Fort Island, 
some of those uh, indentations are still on that hangar door. <laughs> anyway, uh, I didn't, re you know, since I didn't recognize them for what they were, I wasn't afraid. I didn't think there was any danger to me. My interest was drawn to a big old bomb hanging there on the bottom of the fuselage between, between the landing gear on that old diving dog bomber, you know. Uh, I watched that bomb separate, separated from that airplane, wobbled as it began to fall. Oh, and that airplane began to pull out of its dive. By the time it had completed its dive and was a level flight, I don't think it was more than 100, 150 feet over my head, you know. It's then that I first saw and recognized that big round red insignia there on the bottom of the wing. That and the fact that he's just dropped a bomb has convinced me that these are not the friendly fellows I thought they might be, you know. I turned around, hurried back inside the hangar, hoping I could find someone with the key to the ammo shack. All of our guns and ammunition was locked up, and I wanted to get a hold of a gun and get at these guys, you know. But as I come in the front door, the other guy people that are on duty with that morning were heading out the back door. Somebody, I suppose the duty officer said, hey, you, follow me. I went after them, you know, uh, but when they went out the back door, instead of turning to the right and going down to where the ammo shack was located, they turned to the left, went out there somewhere near the other end of the hangar, jumped into an on-field construction ditch. I followed, jumped in after them. I hit the bottom of that ditch, looked up, I'm looking right at a guy there in his white uniform, you know. The work uniform was blue bell-bottom dungaree trousers and a blue chambray work shirt. But he was in his dress uniform, as though he was going into Honolulu, going to church or something. Never did find out why he was in his white uniform. But I'm so thankful that he was, because there, on the left sleeve of that uniform, was a petty officer's rating badge. And I recognized the winged, round cannonball, the insignia of an aviation ordinsman. You the duty ordsman, yeah. You got a key for the ammo shack, yeah. Well, let's go get some guns and ammunition and shoot these blankety-blankety-blanks, you know. So I had much more than hit the bottom of that ditch, and I... Not Thank you. And I and that ordinance men were on our way up out of the ditch. Somebody, again, I suppose the duty officer calls out, get back in the ditch. Get back in the ditch. I don't want to be in that ditch. We're military men. We should be putting up a defense. We shouldn't be here in this ditch. Besides, I know this is the beginning of that war that they've been talking about and we've been preparing for. And I'm from a very proud family. And I damn well know that if I'm going to lose my life in this or any other battle of this war, I would want my family and my country to know that I died fighting, not hiding. <laughs> <laughs>